for the invitation to join you all tonight. Uh, it's, uh, it's been some time since I haven't been in this city. I, uh, I used to come here very frequently when I was uh, uh, doing work at, uh, in, in at the University of Cambridge. This was at, back in, uh, in the year 2001. So it's, uh, it's been a while. Uh, many things have, uh, have happened. Many things have changed. Uh, but one thing that has not changed international landscape is that we still do not have global recognition of the right to a healthy environment and how can that be? Uh, that's one of the things I will uh, address in, in my talk. But I thought I'd um, tell you a little bit more about uh, myself. I'm originally from Chile and uh, a few of the, couple of the things that I was uh, doing before joining Human Rights Watch um, about six months ago, as you created a new division on environment and human rights. Uh, I'll speak to that uh, in a second. So one of the things I was doing, I was uh, in environmental diplomacy negotiating on behalf of, of the Chilean government and on, on behalf of coalitions in which Chile participated. So in that capacity, for example, I was um, legal coordinator for ILAC in the climate space. Some of you may be familiar with this. So this is uh, a coalition of Latin American countries uh, that um, negotiated, negotiate as a block in the climate space, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. That was a long process, many long nights uh, in Paris and, and elsewhere. But uh, as a result, uh, there is human rights language in the preamble of that agreement. And we can come back to that and to discuss its significance. Uh, another thing I was doing, I thought I'd mention, is, um, is academia. So I've been teaching for the last, uh, what, I don't want to count, but uh, maybe since 19, 20 years now. Uh, most recently at uh, George Washington University uh, School of Law, there I teach international environmental law and a specialized course, course uh, on human rights and the environment, um, which uh, Professor Dinah Shelton uh, invited me to. For those, for those of you who don't know her, she's been one of the pioneers in, in this field. Uh, so that's a very brief introduction. Anyone acquainted with the Center for International Environmental Law will know, will know that it is a niche organization that utilizes international law to advance environmental protection. Uh, in international negotiations, international disputes, or the empowerment of communities for defending their rights. But so much by way of background. Uh, anybody acquainted with Human Rights Watch? What does it do? Kind of, a little bit, maybe, maybe not. Anyways, human, uh, w -h -r -w that's the, uh, the website. Human Rights Watch is a human rights advocacy organization that goes out to the field to investigate human rights abuses. It will document through a tested methodology um, and it will expose them to the powers that be. Uh, the slogan of uh, tyranny has a witness. So there will be reports of human rights abuses and those reports will be uh, presented to governments that are violating human rights or where there are businesses involved, that will be the case, or if there are international organizations involved, that will also be the case. Uh, that methodology has centered largely on civil and political right, rights. International humanitarian law as well is involved on conflict, the loss of war. Uh, so the abuses to the right to life, torture, and forced disappearances. The organization began looking at economic, social, cultural rights as well uh, some time ago now, and there's very good material that has been produced in that area, right to health and, or education, uh, etc. And earlier this year, at the beginning of the year, the organization figured out, decided that it was time to engage environmental issues. Uh, that um, there had been uh, some incursions into the environmental themes by various divisions within the organization. The organization is structured along regional divisions, the Americas and Africa and uh, Europe and Asia, etc. 
and thematic divisions, so women's rights or children's rights or people with disabilities. And so the organization decided to create a new thematic division that will focus on environment, environment and human rights. And that's when I, I came in the organization, into the organization to prepare a work plan, figure out what it is that we're going to do, which cases are we going to investigate, which priority areas we're going to tackle. And through a process of internal consultation, finally we have that in place. We have figured that we're going to work on three main pillars. You mentioned environmental defenders. That's one of the pillars or focal areas because that's where human rights and environment so clearly comes, come together. If people that are advocating for environmental protection are not secure in the enjoyment of their most basic rights, then society really cannot engage in a dialogue through which environmental issues can be addressed or can be addressed uh, effectively. So questions of participation, questions of access to information, the social dialogue or societal dialogue, access to justice, these are issues that uh, are key for environmental activists, environmental defenders to be able to do their job. When do uh, government policies with respect to the environment change? Well, it's usually not when there's an enlightened bureaucrat in some capital that says, See, yeah, okay, this is a good idea. There is some of that too going on, not to dismiss or discount, but things really begin to change when people mobilize, when people come together, when they organize. And organizing means that there needs to be information to understand what's happening. And often that information is lacking, whether it's a infrastructure project like a hydroelectric dam that threatens to displace indigenous peoples from their lands, or whether it's a, a more general policy. Uh, it's just in, in a meeting where the situation in Barbuda was being described to us, Antigua and Barbuda, Hurricane Irma, you may see in the news a couple of weeks ago, people displaced from Barbuda, the government now thinking of changing the communal land regime into individual plots and that has all kinds of implications for environmental protection and conservation. So that's in a, in a way a good segue to talk about the second focal area because uh, if, if, the, if, the, if the pillar is on environmental defenders and their ability to lead and mobilize and engage in dialogue, uh, here we see how climate is aggravating the challenges facing societies. And often we see that governments respond to climate change in ways that are not in observance with their human rights obligations. So questions of discrimination, for example, the discriminatory impact of climate change, but also the disproportionate impacts, the equity dimensions or inequity dimensions, but also what do governments do and how do they respond to climate? Relabeling hydroelectric power and large dams and large reservoirs as, as clean energy is often used to justify the forceful relocation of indigenous people from their lands and territories, which, if done in contravention with international human rights standards, is a human rights violation. So we're looking at making sure that we address the climate problem, but we don't do it at the expense of the rights of people. We don't sacrifice, especially the marginalized and the poor, in order for the benefit of uh, um, solving uh, the climate uh, there's so much more that I could say about that, but briefly introducing these focal areas, uh, the last one that I thought I'd mention and that we are working on is, uh, is on toxics and uh, agrochemicals, hazardous waste. So the environmental health connection, the chemicals and how they are affecting human health. So again, we see very clear linkage between human rights and the environment. Take the example of uh, pesticides in Brazil. Anybody from Brazil? 
So what we're seeing there, and we're starting to investigate this on the ground, is um, Brazil is the largest importer of pesticides in the world. And they are sprayed by airplanes in these monocultures of soy, soy that's planted to feed cattle or other animals for human consumption. So we see the expansion of the so-called Western diet. We see the expansion of an industrial scale agricultural model at the expense of wildlands, uh, carbon intensive, nitrate intensive, pesticide intensive. In Brazil, the lack of enforcement of regulatory protections and environmental laws is, uh, is, is leading to, for example, these planes spraying over towns, spraying over schools. Uh, how would we feel if a, if a plane right now came and sprayed all of us here or outside uh, with paraquat? These are dangerous chemicals. So, of course, people are unhappy about that, being polluted to death is not a joke. Uh, and so what we will do is go investigate that situation, we will document it, and use those reports to put pressure on the Temer administration, Michel Temer, and the, we don't know how long he'll be able to continue to um, appease the political uh, uh, system there to remain in power, but we will put pressure on the Brazilian government to make sure that the law is complied with that people are respected in their rights, their children are not sprayed over in their schools. That gives you an example of, of the work that we do in these, uh, in these three focal areas. So much for perhaps on, on Human Rights Watch. Um, uh, but perhaps you have questions. I mean, we don't need to wait until I've spoken 30 minutes for questions. So in any, in any time, if you have a question at any moment, just raise your hand and uh, I'll stop yeah. talking. Ask, yes, please. What, what size is the team that works on these three significantly enormous issues? So it's uh, it's two researchers and, uh, and and the director of the of the program. In the case in that in this instance is my, it's my role. Um, I should I should also mention that we are not substituting for the for other divisions in their environment work. We're not, say, taking over and concentrating the environment work of the organization in one division. Other divisions continue to do that. And the fact that now we have an environment division means that the organization as a whole has more capacity to deal with situations where environmental degradation and failed policies in respect of the environment are resulting in human rights violations, people who suffer from pollution or the unsustainable extraction of natural resources. And so that gives a leverage to uh, the division that we would otherwise not have. So we work with other divisions, say, on women's uh, rights or children's rights, uh, etc. What do you find, your, like, that's kind of like a fairly small team, although it's not, as you say, it's not really like a focused team that looks after just one element. But what do you find your challenges are as a fairly recent kind of new department and that sort of thing, especially with such a wide-ranging, as, as um, you mentioned, sort of wide-ranging kind of issues? Right. Well, the challenge is, uh, is to prioritise to be able to focus on specific work streams that can then have an impact on changes in government policy. Because what we're seeing around the world is a mess. That's no secret. Just read the newspaper or look at dedicated websites. You can find worthwhile stories to investigate in every corner of the planet. So which ones would, will we engage? Yeah. Is it going to be uh, contained animal feed operations in the United States and the pollution that they generate uh, uh, and expose uh, poor 
African American community, so kind of environmental racism, or is it this case of uh, of Barbuda, where uh, as, uh, under the apparently the pretext of climate reconstruction, the government is evicting people from their communal lands? Uh, the list is incredibly long. So the challenge of uh, of prioritizing is the biggest one that we face. Do you believe the, the, the problems are more uh, uh, in uh, rural areas or uh, urban areas? Because well, nowadays we we, see, we know the the reality of mega cities to and the a lot of questions of pollution to and how people can live in small rooms and small house and small flats. Uh, for example, we have uh, some examples uh, in Asia now, and uh, some news that are uh, being published of people who uh, don't have uh, uh, quality, life quality, uh, because they live in really small uh, places. Do you, do you believe that most challenges are in urban or uh, rural areas for uh, human rights for much? Well, I, I, I think that, that, that we can find challenges in both the urban space and the rural space. Uh, we can also f see that some challenges are global in nature. Uh, so the global commons are involved, or is it the atmosphere, and how that then finds its way to affecting specific people, and how governments fail to respond effectively or in ways as required by their human rights obligations. So the, the, the sources or the di and the dimensions of problems, it's multifaceted, it varies, it's complex. Uh, but to give you an example of something that we're doing right now, in, um, in Lebanon, anybody from Lebanon? Anyways, uh, Le in Lebanon, one of the big issues in the country has, uh, has uh, become uh, the ability to manage waste. Uh, of course, this is an issue that every society faces, but the problem was very acute there because the government did not have an effective policy to deal with waste and waste management. So in Beirut, a big city, what happened? Well, the waste was taken to a dump and burned, set on fire. And, you know, it doesn't take scientists to know that when you burn something you can have smoke and when people inhale smoke they don't inhale fresh air so again we don't need to be scientists we then work with scientists to document impacts and to be able to um, report on it in a detailed way in a scientifically credible way uh, but the bigger narrative is such that uh, it shows how urban problems are not dissociated from the environment. That the environment is urban, it's rural, it's global, it's local, it has so many dimensions. And when people suffer as a result of environmental degradation and failed government policies, conduct, we will investigate. Well, it is true. We are we are quite new, and uh, and and so we are uh, gearing up to celebrate at the opportune time when successes <laughs> do come about, uh, when the the division begins to uh, deliver its first products, and we engage in the advocacy that follows, because it's it's not just documenting, investigating, and documenting. It is also conducting the advocacy necessary to get a change in policy and to, to strengthen the pathways for accountability and for the aggrieved people to receive the kind of remedies that they request if that is the situation or the systemic change comes about. Uh, but more generally, uh, I could mention, for example, the work that has been done on, on, on mercury and, um, and the success in the entry into force of a global regulatory regime, the Minamata Convention on Mercury. It's a impo very important instrument because um, the chemicals agenda internationally is patchwork 
terms you've studied this there is a, an instrument dealing with transboundary movement of hazardous waste and then there's another instrument dealing with movements of, uh, of uh, certain chemicals and another trying to control persistent organic pollutants but this is all patched and it's not there's no framework that's coherent and mercury it was falling through the cracks and mercury is a very dangerous chemical uh, and so as a result of sustained advocacy partnerships we went down to the field and documented in how children are being exposed by mercury fumes and how that has affected and impaired their uh, development their health uh, in artisanal gold mining and in other areas all of that advocacy and as I, as I mentioned the partnerships led then to the elaboration of the Mercury uh, Convention, which contains some very important human rights elements of participation and education and uh, also in the formulation of government policies. The first conference of the parties took place a couple of weeks ago and entered into force a couple of months ago in August. So now we're seeing that international law is strengthened to deal with a serious environmental threat. So I think that's a cause for celebration. That's a great for development. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was uh, just wanting you to go back to the first point you made about global recognition of the right to environment. And I mean, why you think that that's in the sense that national at the national level, maybe 90 countries now have a right to environment in some way, regional level, a lot of the regions have now adopted, or at least, say, Europe and Africa now have some sort of right to environment. Uh, so if you could expand from your perspective why the national, sorry, international level, um, it's so important to get that. Right, right, I'd be happy to. And that's the uh, theme of, uh, of today's uh, talk. So maybe that's a good, very good segue, and then we can, again, open it up for uh, for further discussion in a few minutes. So the integration of human rights and the environment uh, at the international level, uh, there's a history there. There's a history uh, at the United Nations, for example. The, at the time, the, what, what was the uh, UN Commission on Human Rights, so the predecessor of the current Human Rights Council, the organ that was mandated um, uh, to monitor human rights uh, situations and to contribute to standard setting in the field of human rights. The Human Rights Commission had a subsidiary organ, a, a sub-commission on the prevention of, of discrimination, which was mainly experts coming together to study novel issues. And they started looking at human rights and the environment back in 1990, so in the lead up to the Rio Conference on Environment and, and Development. Um, this was uh, more than a decade after the Stockholm Conference on the Human Environment in 1972, which is a landmark in the development of, uh, of the field because it was the first time that the international community focused on the global dimensions of the environment. The environment, before that, if, if at all, it figured within domestic policy making. It's true that there had been some international treaties on, say, shared water courses or shared uh, natural resources or conservation seals or fisheries and the like. But this was a moment, a watershed moment, where the ima collective imagination of humanity, to put it in, in big terms, was, uh, came together, it was open, increasing awareness. And the resulting narrative, so the vision f that came out of that conference, proclaimed that, uh, uh, well, it said, man has a fundamental right to live in an environment that is conducive to a life of uh, dignity and, and well-being. So the linkage between human rights and the environment was already seen in that proclamation. Now we would talk about humans. The idea is the same, is the same. So in the field of standard setting of clarifying linkages and how can movement on this issue go forward, uh, 
the subcommission began studying this. And its work was quite interesting, but then fell completely flat when it proposed the Declaration of Human Rights and the Environment to the Commission. This was back in 1994. And the Commission, the Human Rights Commission, completely ignored it. It did not take any action. That marked the end of uh, an era. But of course, these issues wouldn't go away. Just because the United Nations human rights system was unable to deal with them, doesn't mean that the struggle for accountability at the local level and at the national level and then at the international will go away. Because what we're seeing here is that human rights, as it developed after the Second World War, followed a, its own track with the Bill of Rights, first the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and then the International Covenants, and then specific treaties on women or children, uh, more recently on persons with disabilities. And in a very separate, in a totally separate track, the environment, especially after Stockholm, began to see the emergence of a whole new body of law, of international law, uh, international treaties on uh, the ozone layer, uh, global commons, uh, the international treaties on endangered species, uh, on uh, uh, protection of wetlands of international significance. And after Rio, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, or the Convention on Biological Diversity. But the approaches that these two bodies of law were very different. One, entitling individuals, more recently groups as well, collective rights, to certain inalienable rights uh, that are fundamental for a life of dignity or for upholding human dignity. And in the environmental field, not so much in a, a rights-based approach, but a management of we have a problem, how can we address it, standards of environmental quality, how much emissions can a facility emit into the river until the river is no longer suitable for providing clean water to a city or to uh, riparian communities and the like. For this reason, some observers, some commentators have noted that uh, environmental law, more than being preoccupied with environmental protection, has been preoccupied with slowing down the gradual destruction of the planet, but nevertheless, that's the direction it's going. And so there's a lot of dissatisfaction with environmental law. At the same time, in the international level, states have repeatedly stated, reaffirmed, that they have a sovereign right to determine environmental policy and environmental standards. So while environmental law finds itself within the strong realm of state sovereignty in the track of human rights, this is recognized as an anchor for international uh, interest, that uh, issues concerning human rights are of the competence of the international community, and that there is a basis for international action and monitoring and scrutiny and, and the like. This has meant that the dialogue between the two fields is not always easy, because there are different approaches, because there are different techniques, because there are different underlying principles. And nevertheless, for a community down on the ground that is affected by environmental degradation, right systems were facing applications of environmental contamination, the global, the, the Human Rights Committee at the United Nations uh, overseeing implementation compliance with uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights began receiving applications. Whenever there was a possibility of international recourse, yes, after exhaustion of remedies, but those mechanisms began receiving applications, requests, calls for uh, looking at a specific uh, case. And as a result, a body of jurisprudence or quasi-jurisprudence, people began to think, how can we link these two? And that evolution, uh, 
we saw that moment in the early 1990s that I was describing. But it, as I mentioned, it didn't go away. It continued. It continued until uh, about six years ago when the Human Rights Council decided to establish a special procedure on human rights and the environment to clarify the standards, to clarify the human rights obligations in respect of a clean and healthy uh, and safe and sustainable environment. Uh, Professor John Knox, some of you may know him, he's uh, from Wake Forest University, he was uh, in the United States. He was appointed as mandate holder and he, was, he has conducted a whole process of discussion to clarify those standards. This is why I'm here today because I was in Geneva earlier this week in the final round of expert consultations that he held on what he's elaborating uh, as the, uh, a statement or a synthesis of obligations, of state obligations in respect of, of the environment. Uh, and so, for example, he has been able to identify general obligations, as in uh, uh, environmental defenders or uh, the measures that need to be taken to protect human rights from environmental uh, degradation. More specific procedural obligations, the, the right to access information on, uh, information on environmental matters, or the right to participate meaningfully in environmental decision making, or the right to go to court to obtain a remedy, or to an administrative process to obtain a remedy. Environmental assessments prior and independent, environmental and social assessments of projects or policies and the like. And also substantive obligations, so the duty to set up a normative framework that respects human rights, or how international environmental norms should be given effect and enforced in compliance with that body of, of international law. And also looking at the particular situation of vulnerable peoples, uh, those that are marginalized or, or find themselves in vulnerable situations. Children are more, more vulnerable to pollution because of their bodies, the way that they their, their biological composition. Women may find themselves in vulnerable situations, for example, after, uh, after um, environmental storms or an earthquake. Uh, this has also been documented. People with disabilities, special treatment for indigenous peoples, spiritual integration with the land, standards such as free and prior informed consent and the like. So a whole body of, of law that has been clarified showing this interaction between human rights and the environment. But where is the right to a healthy environment in all of this? Well, it's conspicuously absent uh, from that discussion. The way that uh, um, Many expected this mandate to evolve was that it would lay the groundwork for a, politi a political moment where the UN organ and, uh, charged with a human rights policy uh, standard setting, that is the Human Rights Council, would be able to come out and proclaim through resolution the existence of this right. Uh, for people that were expecting this mandate on human rights and the environment to deliver this, this is a big disappointment. Of course, because now instead of getting the council to be at that moment, we have clarification of a body of law, which is important of course, but it's no substitute for a global proclamation of the right. And this gets then to your question. Why is it important to have a global proclamation? Why is the need for this? Because you could very well say, well, maybe we don't need global recognition. We can use this body of law in order to get at the same place. Uh, and that's, that's fair as an argument goes, but it's limited. And here are a couple examples of limitations. Uh, in our work, we have worked with environmental defenders in the field. And uh, one, one theme that comes out of those conversations is the question of legitimacy and stigmatization. So uh, 
the, the government or um, corporate uh, business entities uh, interests will often attempt to delegitimize the work of environmental activists uh, through all kinds of, of means. And one of them is by noting anti-state or anti-development or anti-the public interest. Uh, and these labels are very strong because um, they often lead to the, the application of anti-terrorism legislation against them or uh, the uh, surveillance techniques that are uh, prohibited under uh, domestic and international law. One way of legitimizing the work of environmental defenders is to ground the work in the defense of human rights. Uh, and so as a counter to, say, the right to development, misunderstood right to development is the right to a healthy environment. A person that's defending the right to a healthy environment is not against the development of the country or the development of their community or against the public interest. It's in favor of making sure that development does not compromise environmental protection. And that is something that has been reaffirmed at least for the last 25 years now in the international legal landscape. So that's an important baseline point that I think is is very important to, uh, to keep in mind. But there's more, I would say, that, uh, that if we think about the normative content of the right being embodied by this body of law that has been clarified, that's all well and good. But in a way, that's a capstone. Uh, uh, but the history is dynamic and continues to evolve. There are issues that need to be addressed that have not yet been addressed such as questions of global environmental justice, extraterritorial application of human rights law. What is the responsibility of the United States as the historically largest emitter of greenhouse gases for the plight of the citizens in the Maldives that are seeing their country disappear under the waters? Is human rights a useful framework for dealing with that issue? the right to a healthy environment could help us see the equity dimension of that problem and the issue of accountability, not at that level of generality only, but as, as a pathway, as a, as a tool that can get us uh, where we need to be. And then there's issue, so, so in that sense, there's normative development, progressive development to address the novel issues that our society in the 21st century is facing. So we're not just replicating what we learned in the 20th century, but that we're facing the novel challenges that we're, that we're facing. Um, and what challenges are those? Well, climate change is clearly an example. But then we have biodiversity loss as the fifth wave of extinction. Maybe 10 years of now we'll wake up collectively and say, well, we've made progress of, on, on climate change. But where are all the animals and the plants? Where have all they? Where have they gone? Well, they're gone. I mean, uh, there was a speaker who attended a, a conference some time ago where he was saying that um, for a species that goes extinct, the word later or the word tomorrow doesn't have any content. It, the species that goes extinct is gone. There's no brain coming back. There's no later I'm going to go for dinner, or later we'll have a snack. There's that dimension of later just is no longer there. So that's a very different world. Uh, if we as humanity collectively are now defining, say, the Paris Agreement uh, on climate change, as I mentioned, I was involved in the negotiation of that, so take part of the responsibility in a way, of defining an objective for understanding what is a climate system that is um, free from dangerous interference. Well, it's a climate system where the temperature doesn't exceed 2 Celsius above pre-industrial levels, or at least 1.5. We can have that debate. No, but what does that mean? It means that we as humans now come to say how hot the planet is going to be. Now, that's a physical. Uh, 
geophysical dimension to our interaction, our human interaction with nature, for the first time in history we're seeing that. What are the moral responsibilities of that? I don't think we've be, even begun to have that discussion. Having the right to a healthy environment, I, I, I understand it gives a vocabulary that's based on values where we can have that conversation of are we going to decide now which species go extinct and which are allowed to live? Uh, well, that's what we're doing with determining how hot the planet can be or not. Uh, so building that vocabulary, there's a question of coherence as well in the international landscape of uh, policy coherence that's important. Um, uh, I think that's what, in a way, is a segue to the last thing I want to say. Uh, uh, yeah. Just picking up a little bit more on what Bisho was saying, I mean, understood it. So you have you know, nearly 90 countries that have a healthy environment or language similar to that within their constitutions, right? Um, and, and a great number of those are with, in developing countries. You've also got some interesting judgments over so some regional courts and particularly um, you know, uh, <coughs> human rights within the uh, America and how has that fed in to what's happening at the international level now and how has it not fed in, in and, and what's the kind of politics around? right the the office of the high commissioner for human rights um, back in 1994 they conducted a study and found a good number of constitutions containing the right to a healthy environment uh, Call the exact number at this time, uh, but when was it? In 2009, 2000, and, no, I'm sorry, 2011, more or less. A new study came about and found more than a hundred constitutions. In fact, more than 140 constitutions had included language resembling a right to health in various formulations right to a healthy environment or right to a healthy and sustainable environment. Um, so I'm us using right to a healthy environment as a shorthand for all of that. So we, see, we have seen an impressive amount of normative development at the national level. Um, in the last five years, more than 20 constitutions are referring to future generations. So we're seeing that as well as an element of this, uh, of this, um, of this development. Now, what impact does that have on, say, the emergence of customary international law? That, as, as we know, international practice coupled with the belief of giving effect to an international obligation, well, this is, this is state practice at the highest level of the social contract in the state, the, the constitution, the, the basis for the social dialogue within a community, a political community. Uh, that question has largely been skirted. The people, some, some academicians are willing to engage in that, but governments are not for the most part. Even those governments that have recognized, which are the majority now in the world, they don't necessarily want to talk about that. Um, so there is some level of resistance to the global recognition. There's some level of inertia as well inertia because um, back in the day when these debates began to surface in the international landscape uh, there were questions that had not been answered fully uh, questions say as to the justiciability of economic social and cultural rights well we've learned a lot about that collectively uh, there's now even a protocol on, on that specific issue there's a whole body of constitutional jurisprudence around the world or issues on um, on collective rights um, in some countries, and still today, will say, well, no, human rights are individual rights. They there cannot be such thing as collective rights. But the African Charter recognizes collective rights. The, as you mentioned, in the Inter-American Human Rights System, collective rights of indigenous peoples have been advanced quite vigorously. The UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples collective rights. So we've learned that human rights are not just individual rights, that the right to a, say, a healthy environment 
can have individual and collective dimensions with her. So that there's a there's resistance by inertia that there are questions that lingered 20 years ago, and um, some legal offices and some foreign affairs ministries are still trying to ju they just dust off their old talking points instead of updating what is their legal thinking about this. So there's an element there's an element of that, but there's also an element of accountability and this pendulum that goes back and forth between the uh, affirmation and reaffirmation and glorification of state sovereignty as an unqualified, unfettered power on the one hand, and then on the other, the uh, recognition that the state is a vehicle and its legitimacy depends on its ability to observe rights and honor its commitments. That equation that the pendulum is constantly moving and I think that we're move, we're seeing in the climate space especially the dilution of the uh, traditional role that international law had played uh, in constraining of sovereignty uh, and, and in, in uh, uh, reflecting how uh, human rights qualify legitimize state authority to seeing that um, the state will do whatever it can, whatever it wants, uh, within a framework. So international law setting up a very general loose framework for dialogue where the state will really figure out what it's going to do. So there's no large, significant constraint on conduct. but. So this is the bottoms-up approach of the Paris Agreement, the f what is really an abdication of responsibility of the international community to have a principled basis for the reduction of emissions. Is it going to be per capita? Well, we don't know. Is it going to be by territory? Is it going to be historical emissions? How do we come up with a principled approach to reducing emissions so that we can have a safe and healthy planet? Well, we give up. We gave up collectively. We, instead of that, we have a system where every every state does what it wants, what it want, what it can. It's voluntary in that sense. It's unilateral. Now, having said that, I mean I don't want to lose faith or de de downplay the significance of the Paris Agreement either. But I do want to have a reality check there as well. There are top-down mechanisms that are intended to ensure that whatever the state comes up with, that it will honor them. That if the state, that there will be adequate measuring, that there'll be reporting, so that there is at least a semblance of environmental integrity and credibility to the regime, that we're not deluding ourselves with uh, these illusions of action while reality goes in a different direction. But anyway, I think I'm moving in a tangent uh, there, uh, perhaps uh, for a moment. Um, where does the right to a healthy environment fit in all of that? Uh, you've seen that uh, the French, building on the diplomatic success of uh, COP21 back in 2015 and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, have launched a new initiative, a global pact for the environment. One of its pillars, center pillar, is the right to a healthy environment. Not in that formulation, again, formulations vary, um, but uh, that is the pillar of this new initiative that is now proceeding at the General Assembly. Will it survive? Will it go anywhere? Will the French succeed in setting up an intergovernmental working group with a mandate to negotiate the Global Pact? that can build on the draft that they released? Or will we see that the initiative will sink in the lab, become lost in the labyrinths of the United Nations, uh, or it will become another uh, failed, uh, another failed good idea? It's yet to be seen. What we are seeing so far is that 
Some countries are supporting the French on that. Uh, in the Americas, for example, Brazil, Mexico, Chile, Costa Rica. These are important countries in the regions. And so, uh, as we can see, uh, similar developments in other regions in, uh, as well. And so we, it may be that the process begins to catch steam that uh, the French can mobilize their diplomacy in, uh, in this direction. And if the draft is the baseline that then gets strengthened, maybe that's overly optimistic, but if, if that's the scenario, then in a few years that may be a vehicle for global recognition in a treaty of the right to a healthy environment. There would be a monitoring mechanism associated to that. And again, the biggest part of this is what your question is alluding to, that there would be a layer of accountability to hold the state accountable for what it does. So that if its policies are resulting in environmental degradation that affects human rights, those who suffered are not left out in the cold, but have a place, have a mechanism that can give them a remedy. Rudimentary as these mechanisms are, that there can be a level of empowerment, and even a historical conscience. Uh, I've worked with uh, the Inuit, for example, in, in the Arctic, uh, uh, in presenting a, a human rights petition to the Inter-American Human Rights System denouncing the United States violation of their of their rights. Uh, the Inuit were not interested in money or material remedies. They wanted history to witness what they were suffering as a result of the melting permafrost and the dislocation in their societies, the displacement, the opening up of the Arctic to the influx of all kinds of uh, economic interest that was disrupting their culture, the fact that they could no longer build igloos, they could no longer hunt, go hunting in their traditional ways because the um, the ice was thin and they would, it would break and they would fall in the, and die. The, so the disruption of their culture, they wanted historical witness to that and they wanted the human rights system to be able to walk with them in that chronicle. That's what they wanted. So that's a remedy in it of itself. Uh, uh, so perhaps I'll stop there and we, we can open it up uh, and continue our conversation. Yeah. I'd like to ask you if, uh, what, what do you think uh, could be the role of other non-state uh, uh, actors in uh, international law? Because in fact, uh, if we look at uh, the, the global re uh, reality, um, there's a lot of uh, multinational companies that some, we could look at, at them and, and think that most of them have more power uh, than states, uh, econ more economic power and, and, and sometimes also political. Uh, do you believe that, uh, well, in, fa in fact, in the, the, the Paris Agreement, there are, they, they refer the non-party stakeholders uh, that, in fact, are not uh, in, it's difficult to enforce them to, to comply with uh, treaties and with agreements. Uh, what do you think are, could be the role of these uh, non-state actors? Yeah, the, the, the phraseology or terminology of, of non-state actors in a way is, is, is misleading because uh, uh, to define something by uh, reference to what it is not is a very broad very broad category then that so we are not non-state actors you and I and everybody here and international organizations are non-state the, the framing of non-party stakeholders was used to be able to encompass um, local governments as well because otherwise we would be talking about civil society or non-governmental organizations uh, it is also encompassing for-profit uh, interests, so associations of industries that come together to lobby in defense of their collective inter interests. So it's it's quite an encompassing term. It's non-party uh, stakeholders, uh, uh, which has, has it has gained traction in the climate space, and now we're seeing it spill over to uh, other spaces. Uh, 
uh, as well, say the UN Environmental Assembly or uh, of, of the UN Environment Program um, and, and the like. Uh, okay, so but that by way of, of phrasing and, and terminology. Then on the substance of, of your question, what we've seen uh, in, uh, time and again, we've seen it in tobacco, we've seen it in the chemicals context, we've seen it in the uh, uh, oil and gas context, is a deliberate strategy by some companies or some groups of companies to uh, obfuscate public opinion and perception on science. That um, the science on climate change is unsettled. How are we going to act if there's uncertainty? We don't know whom to believe. Um, that kind of um, strategy is, uh, is deliberate. It's systematic. Uh, one. Second, misinformation. Mis putting out information that is known to be untrue. Uh, sure, there's freedom of speech, but that's one thing as having an opinion. Another is paying scientists to say things that are false. Uh, that is something else. Or um, you may have seen, uh, so that's one example, you may have seen the, uh, the decision that uh, was rendered by the International Tribunal for Monsanto in The Hague, it's a long title. So this was a people's tribunal, an opinion tribunal, uh, that uh, examined Monsanto's practices in relation to various rights, the right to health, the environment, the right to health. It looked at the freedom indispensable for scientists to carry out their work, and it found that Monsanto allegedly Monsanto didn't participate in the in, in the tribunal proceedings, so, and it's not a court of law under the state. So, allegedly, you know, it uh, uh, paid think tanks and other groups to put out what were pseudo scientific materials that would cast doubt on the state of the science on certain issues. It would again, target scientists and their work when they criticized Monsanto and Monsanto's products, glyphosate especially. Um, now those practices, they are not the exercise of freedom of expression as in an opinion that's voiced out. They are intended to silence and stifle scientific debate which is removing or undermining an important tool that society has, an essential tool that society has at its disposal to adopt recent policies. So science as a benchmark of rationality. Yeah. Uh, in the United States these days we see marches uh, to defend scientists. Science is real. question is the one you're asking, what is its significance or non-significance? These countries that I mentioned, uh, uh, they wanted human rights to be not only in the preamble but in the operational articulation of the objective because that would give human rights an entry point that is much stronger than the preambular language and interpretative role of the preamble. If, it, if it's in the, uh, in the objective, then we can measure success or failure also using human rights as a benchmark. There was a strong resistance to that. One, because it was uh, misunderstood, I would say, that uh, it could lead to conditionality. Uh, there's a whole history of human rights being used or abused as a reason for uh, conditionality in aid or projects. This is one of the reasons that, at least formally on its face, the World Bank is still arguing that it won't take human rights into account in its lending practices. Uh, it doesn't matter if the government is a, a dictatorship where there's no freedom of expression and assembly. They won't f look at that because they're interested in economic development and they won't condition that 
support to the human rights practices of that country. So that kind of that kind of idea was um, at play there. But I think that that was overcome eventually. And what uh, also played a role there was that um, some countries thought that if we talk about human rights in the objective, it could give grounds to uh, litigation either by between states or that states would be sued on that basis. Which well, I think is also a misunderstanding because states will be sued anyway. Uh, and they are being sued. Uh, their agenda case, you may have seen it, or otherwise I encourage you to look at that. So that's going to that we're, that's, we will see that happening as as well. Uh, what is the significance? It means the way that it's framed. It's telling us that uh, that states, when taking climate action, cannot ignore their human rights obligations. So it's not imposing a uniform standard of human rights. It is reminding each state that it by entering into a climate, or in a climate context, it does not leave aside its human rights obligations. Any obligation that it has assumed by virtue, say, of customary law or uh, becoming a party to a human rights treaty, it must uphold those in, when taking climate action, so when responding to climate. Um, so this is mainly in the context of climate adaptation, if it's taking measures to uh, confront the changes that are coming, it cannot do so discriminatorily or by disfavoring marginalized groups or in ways that disproportionately impact certain groups over others, uh, for example. But it doesn't leave aside, potentially, the issue of, of mitigation. So its significance lies as a tool for advocacy as well, as a tool for um, at the national level to make sure that, um, say, nationally determined contributions, all of that, is, come, is the result of a participatory process. Uh, so a, a lot could be said about that, but uh, the, last, uh, the last thought I'd share is that um, currently the negotiations uh, are trying to figure out the minutia of regulations, the Paris rule book. How are these, how are the Paris elements, the building blocks, going to be operationalized? How are they going to be implemented? How is the stock taking going to work, or the transparency framework uh, reporting, or the compliance committee? How is it going to operate? These are very detailed rules. If human rights, guided by the preamble, do not find their way into the Paris rule book, then I think largely the preambular language will be uh, non-operational because what matters is the specifics of implementation. And, uh, so there's a big challenge there. Yeah. Just as an extension of the question and updating it today from 2015 to 2017, what do you think is the effect of the new administration in the United States of America, which was a signatory to that agreement? How adversely would it affect the agreement? Well, I, th I think it's quite detrimental to the agreement and to our collective effort to deal with uh, this global threat. Let's recall that uh, the U.S.'s withdrawal from, um, or rejection rather, from Kyoto, of Kyoto, was a big, big reason for the collapse of all that architecture and the elaboration of a new regime, the Paris Agreement. The, the, and so if, when, at the time, the, uh, the US administration argued that uh, Kyoto was flawed because um, uh, it gave uh, big countries like India and China free pass. Uh, and, and, and that it would hurt U.S. economy. Um, but that's rhetorics because uh, the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities in the climate space has been developed precisely because it has been the North that has largely created this problem and 
solving it cannot come at the expense of the poor and the development possibilities of the South. That has been recognized in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. The Paris Agreement is negotiated under the convention. There is differentiation to address this issue. Uh, and yet, uh, it seems that certain countries in the North, the US included, are failing to um, recognize their historical responsibility, both in the past and in the future. Their need to take leadership to address this global problem. So it is a big, big impact when the historically uh, largest emitter of greenhouse gases fails not only to participate in the regime, but begins to dismantle all the efforts that the previous administration, President Obama, had uh, set in place to start addressing the US's contributions to global emissions. Uh, the Clean Power Plants Initiative that would limit the emissions from coal-fired power plants, or this idea that uh, uh, that the government had a war on coal and that coal needs to come back. Uh, I think that economists uh, and others are telling us that that was a myth and that coal is not coming back because of the way that the market is behaving. The green technologies are actually cheaper, more efficient, so that's the future. But anyways, on, on, on your question, uh, I think that that is a huge, a huge problem. And from a human rights angle, as they relate, as human rights and environment relates, a, a, a country that is aware of a risk can't just idly sit and do nothing. It has to take action to deal with that risk when that environmental or threat, threat of environmental harm will harm the rights of people. We can discuss a lot of whether the government's response is adequate, does it go far enough, is it uh, principled, there's a lot of nuance in what the government discretion and what the government can do. But if the government does nothing, then not only arguably do we have a, an environmental problem, we also have a huge Okay. <laughs> well, it's um, almost an hour and a half. Give you a rest. Yeah. <laughs> uh,